of course, when you are a manager, if you come to a club and if, if it's the club of your heart, if the club of your passion, it's, it's a different, obviously. And, but at the same time, uh, I'm so much concerned with uh, what we have to achieve. Uh, at the moment, we have a young team, as you know, and um, we we very much looking forward to performing and getting to the success of the uh, uh, of the former teams. My idea was that to build Liverpool into a bastion of invincibility, you know, like Napoleon had that idea, he would conquer the bloody world, you know. And that's what I wanted, that Liverpool would be uh, untouchable. My idea was to build Liverpool up and up and up until eventually there would be, everybody would have to submit, give in. This is the story of Liverpool Football Club, the most successful side in English football. A story of great games, great players, and of course the managers who shaped the club's destiny. The club, backed by the most passionate and dedicated fans in the country, created history. Despite triumph and tragedy, the Liverpool tradition always maintained, you'll never walk alone. The mining villages in the west of Scotland made Bill Shankly. He said he had a choice work down the pit or play professional football. It was no choice. He loved football. Self-belief drove Shankly. He won a cup winner's medal with Preston and played for his country. Enthusiastic and determined, he was a natural for management. Liverpool's underachievers were slumbering in the second division when Bill Shankly arrived, a nothing club going nowhere. He gave them ambition. He brought them passion. A tide began to swell on Merseyside. Things were beginning to happen. Liverpool FC was about to become the greatest name in British football. Bill joined us in December '59, and then um, I was still a, I was only a young man then, and he um, he transformed the club altogether as regards on the on the playing side. Bill Shankly, it was him. They were in the second division. Uh, he made a statement that it was the biggest hole in the in the in the second division, which was probably right to a degree, because sometimes you would be having a bit of lunch there, which they did on a daily basis, and <laughs> the water would be coming through the ceilings, you know. I mean, the club really was in a, in a bit of, you know, a bit of trouble in the late 50s. But he came, and, and he, he brought so much confidence, and he cleared a lot of players out and brought his own players in. Shankly got off to a good start. He signed Ian St. John and Ron Yates. But I didn't have to make up my mind. Out came the ball, Shanks, you know, he's always immaculate, Bill. A lovely suit, white shirt, lovely tie. And the thing that impressed me, you know, he had white, white teeth, you know. And, and he just said, how are you, uh, big man? And then started to walk around me. And I could hear him at the back of me saying, you know, Jesus Christ, you must be seven foot tall. You know, so when he came round the front, I went, no, I'm only six foot three. He went, that's near enough seven foot for me, son. You know, and I thought, I like this fella. Well, Ronnie Yeats, uh, his coming, along with Ian St. John, around the same time, was the, the very beginning of Liverpool's rise. And they did more for the rise than anybody else. Yeats at the back, St. John at the front. Shankly's first great side not only won promotion, but in 1964, they went and won the Football League. They clinched it with a 5-0 win at home to Arsenal. It was all coming together. Next season, they would play in the European Cup. We finished up beating Arsenal here 5-1, and we still had three games to go. And we ball away from home and we didn't win one, we lost two and drew one. And Shanks didn't have play hell after the games, especially the, the, two, the two we'd lost. And th this was him, he'd, he'd won the first division for the first time, and, um, but he, he worried about not winning these last three games. When they were building the new stand, uh, they were building a, a trophy room, and it had only two trophy cabinets. And he went, I want, the tro I want the trophy cabinets all round this room. And somebody said, well, we haven't got trophies for to put in them. He says, I'll get them. Don't worry about that. Shankly could read men. He knew how to keep their feet on the ground and how to motivate and inspire them. His methods were unique and often startling. 
Ian Callaghan used to tell me about the team talks around the Subutio table where uh, he used to put the opposition, uh, the little Subutio model, the opposition were in white and of course Liverpool in red. And uh, they used to sit around, you could have heard a pin drop and Shanks used to say, you're playing, um, you're playing Manchester United next week. Well, he can't play and he can't play and the players he thought couldn't play, he took them off and put them in his pocket. And I've just done a tape, a sporting portrait of Bill Shankly, in which Shank says on it, he says, um, I, he says, I took Best Lauren Charlton and, and put them in my pocket and I said, they can't play. You no need to worry about them. And this is the kind of uh, psychology Shanks had. And he'd stand by our dressing room and he'd be a visitor and uh, they'd be coming in and like they were all in awe of him as well, like, you know, Shanks, you know, or, hello, Mr. Shankly, oh, so now you look, you're not looking too well today. Have you been out last night? You know, have you trained too hard? Well, if them saying to him saying things that, like that to a player, they think, whew, he's right, I'm tired. Shanks prepared his team for the rigors of Europe with a pre-season tour of America. The thing about Shanks is that he observed his own British ways, and one of the things was he wouldn't change the time on his watch. And they were in New York, and um, Shanks said to Bob, I must go and see Jack Dempsey's bar. So Bob said, I will we'll get to Johnny, do get it, Jacksy Lighton, good now, but Steve Lighton. Anyway, they're in there, and they've only been there about an hour, and they're having a great time, and Shanks is looking at all the memorabilia around the place, and he says, right, Bob, I'm off to bed. So Bob said, but he's doing it blinking nine o'clock. He said, it's bloody two o'clock in the morning, now you know Yank's telling me the time. And stormed off. And on the same tour, he would stick up team sheets at three in the morning. Liverpool's first ever game in Europe was in Reykjavik. Liverpool were off to Iceland. The few intrepid supporters who travelled with them saw Liverpool coast through the first leg. The second leg, they were, of course, they were, they were bowled out in the first leg in Iceland, but uh, uh, were Reykjavik, so there was no chance of an upset. But I always remember the first sign to me of what the cop were later to become. And uh, I think they're up on aggregate about 10-1 at the time, or 10-0, I should say. And um, the cops suddenly decide they've had enough of this, and they start supporting Reykjavik. And every time Liverpool get the ball, they boo. And every time Reykjavik get the ball, they cheer. Well, anyway, Reykjavik mount a sporadic attack. A player goes down in the Liverpool box, and the cops shout, penalty! And the referee gave it. And I think that was their only goal of the two legs. And I thought, well, that's fabulous. I said, that's the cop being the human core they are, not just a football crowd. This is something different. Liverpool gave Reykjavik their expected lesson, but nobody thought it would be the start of 20 unbroken years in Europe. Shankly now changed the kit. All red made them look bigger, stronger, better. I was the man that uh, ran out of Tanfield on a Friday morning, you know, boots on, the red kit on for the first time, came down the stairs, ran out of the pitch, and Shanks and Bob Paisley and uh, the staff were about 20 yards away, and uh, ran on, and... It, the first words out of his mouth was, this is our kit. He says, you look seven foot tall, Ron, in that kit. He says, and even, even, even Ian Callaghan looked the same. And we started playing in a red kit. And it was a lucky kit for us. Shankly gave the new strip its debut against Anderlecht, the Belgian champions. Anderlecht were a formidable team. And after they'd been drawn against them, Joe Mercer rang Shanks and he says, uh, Billy said, I've just seen this Belgian team, the Belgian international team, draw with England at Wembley. It was a 2-2 draw, and he said, they've got eight of this Anderlecht team in the side. You're going to have some game. They're some side. Shanks says, thanks for the warning, Joe. Well, remember that. Anyway, night of the game, players all around. He says, right, boys, he said, you have nothing to beat tonight. They're a load of rubbish. Off they go. Win 3-0, come in. And he says to them, congratulations. You've just beaten one of the best teams in Europe. Liverpool beat Anderlecht again in Brussels. It was a convincing victory. In the quarter-final, they would play Cologne. After two draws, the tie would go to a replay. The match ended all square again. Astonishingly, the result was decided on the toss of a coin. I got in first to the referee. I said, I'll have tails, you know, and, and luckily for me, the referee said, OK, Liverpool tails, Cologne heads. You know, up it went, and Christ, didn't it stick in a divot? And I said to the referee, ref, you're going to have to retoss the coin. And he went, you're right, Mr. Yates, you know, and he picked up the German captain. I thought it was going to hit him, you know, and he went berserk because it was falling over the heads. So he picked it up, up it went again, came down tails. We were chuffed, you know, and uh, it's funny, 
you know, we go around with 10,000 fans through the air, we're coming off, and who is standing at his side with Bill? You know, Bill Shankly, you know, and I was first off the pitch, and he, he went, well done, big man. He says, I'm proud of you. He said, what did you pick? I said, I picked Teals, boss. And I was waiting for the adulation, and he just went, I'd have picked Teals myself, and just walked away. <laughs> you know, talk about keeping your feet on the floor, he was great at it. If you supported Liverpool, life didn't get any better than this. Promotion, league champions, European Cup semi-finalists, and now the FA Cup final for the first time in the club's history. First blood of the match went to Roger Hunt. <laughs> Billy Bremner equalised. The game seemed back where it started. Liverpool were lasting better than their opponents. St. John made no mistake this time. So I'm first up there the stairs to get the cup from the Queen and uh, I've been told what I've seen and, and, and the first words out of my mouth was, you know, he must be very tired. And I, I don't know why I said it and I said, yes I am, I'm absolutely knackered. I couldn't believe what I'd said to the Queen of England, you know, and, and my face went the same colour as, as the jersey and she, and, and she made it easy for me and she went, I could imagine so. With a European Cup semi-final against Inter Milan still to come, Shankly's ambition knew no boundaries. After having the emotional game at Wembley, which drained everybody, you know, to take on the might of, of Inter Milan was the night of nights. And I know there's been great, great nights at Anfield, but I think people of our generation would look back on it and say that was the night. That was when we really come of age and the club come of age. Our ground was full at half past five. You could not get in. You know, when our bus came in, you know, there was just nobody outside of the, of the stadium. They were all inside. Before the game, Shankly pulled off a masterstroke. He stoked up the atmosphere by parading the FA Cup on the pitch. I think the Milan night, even more much later than the St Etienne night, which was another incredible night, I think that Milan night was the most electrically charged occasion I've ever been at. It was absolutely incredible. Strong. Here's number seven, Callaghan. Hunt, a goal. Great goal, a great goal by Hunt. Everyone back in defence now. Hunt, Carl Callaghan, he's done it. I think that's the greatest night that's ever been, because the cup come out, they've never won before, and there we met technically the soundest team in possibly the world, and we beat them 3-1, and the goal that's allowed, it might have been 4-1. Strong going on his right, Hunt is onside, yes, a great save as the trouble scored, and that could put Liverpool in the final. Liverpool were the best in England. They travelled to Milan to prove they were the best in Europe. But in Italy, you didn't always get what you deserved. Inter Milan were experienced European campaigners. Liverpool were not. As regards Europe, <coughs> Shanks was very suspicious of Europeans. He didn't really like them and he didn't really know them. And he was once asked about what you think of the Europeans. He said, Dare. He said, uh, there are a load of thieves, rogues and vagabonds living in their wits in the gutter. I've never seen such uh, hostility. Smoke bombs, they were kind of purple and uh, they were, oh, it was uh, an awful feeling. And of course, the, the decisions on the pitch were clear. First goal was an indirect free kick, which Corsa chipped into the net and he gave goal for it. Tommy Lawrence was going to bounce the ball and as he bounced it, the fella kicked it into the net. It was the decisions. And whilst there's a possibility that even if the decisions eh, had been gone in our favour, Inter Milan might have beat us. And that was it. I mean, I can honestly remember coming off the pitch and I'm thinking, I'm going to hit him. I was so livid at the referee and, I'm, you know, I'm, I'll admit it, I kicked him. Liverpool should have at least had a chance of, of winning the, the, the European Cup in, in 65 and we were on top of our game and we were a good team in those days, you know, we really were and we were up to it but there's no way you can play against the officials. <laughs> Bill 
Bill Shankly had given Liverpool an unbeatable football team for an unbeatable era. Britain's number one port was number one in everything else. It had the Beatles, a job boom and a brilliant football team. It all came together on the terraces at Anfield, on the Spine Cup. It was wonderful, the 60s, when every boy in Liverpool wanted to be musicians and pop stars as they were then. So it was natural, and um, it was wonderful. The banter on the cup was, no one could ever put their finger where it started, but it did, it was just starting right through. I mean, it was just wonderful to stand in the cup with your feet soaking wet, singing, and that was heaven with a pie in your hand. As long as you didn't drop your pie, it was brilliant. They mean everything to me when I come out on the field on a Saturday, I'm prepared to, to die for these people. Oh, when the crowd starts chanting your name, you know, uh, you feel ten feet tall, you, you want to do everything. Well, the cup is exclusive. The, the Spine Cup at Liverpool is an institution. And if you're a member of the cup, you feel as if you're a member of a big society, uh, where you've got thousands of friends all around about you. And they, 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 they're united and loyal. You, you seem to sense the atmosphere of the cup when you go in it. It, it is electrified. You feel as though you're an integral part of the team. Sometimes I can make myself go to sleep at the night thinking of the roar of the cup and just fancying myself thundering down the wing with me stomach hanging over me shorts, you know, and scoring that old vital goal. The cup was always an edge for us. There's no question about it. They had their own system of bringing things to light by the singing in the 60s. Um, and it was always that little edge that when they got out, you know, you, you, you would always defend the cup first half of you could and kick into it second, because they used to say they would suck the ball in the back of the net, you know. Attack! 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 Victory at Wembley had given Liverpool entry into the Cup Winners' Cup. The Cup and the Granada film crew followed them to Hungary. Back then, uh, people hadn't even started going to Benidorm for the holidays. It was new, you know, to get on an aeroplane. It was a bit like the war days. You know, we were all more or less war babies at that time, you know, so we were getting on planes. We felt like we were going over to do a sortie somewhere, you know. The game against Honved was terrible, a goalless draw. In the future, it would be a great result, but not the sort of match Shankly would enjoy. The supporters and the players hit the town anyway. Somehow or rather end up on this stage with the, the dancing girls uh, doing the twist. Little did I know that I was being filmed by Granada TV. We had a good time, went home. It was on the night after we'd come back from uh, playing Hornbed. I'm sitting in the city with my wife and uh, she's saying, you know, I like a place, was it wrong? I said, oh, bloody awful place. Said nothing to do, you know. I said we had a couple of drinks afterwards, and that's all fair enough. And that whenever I'd said this, you know, the nightclub appeared on the television, and I, and I thought to myself, a nightclub. I said I can't believe this. I'm going to be on this, and there I was, you know. And uh, you probably got the footage of me doing the twist with these girls, you know. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I looked over, and, and the wife looked at me, and she went. I thought you said there was nothing to do. Liverpool went on to reach the final of the Cup Winners' Cup in Glasgow. They met Borussia Dortmund, but nothing went right. On the night, we weren't that good. I mean, we got beat 2-1 after extra time. The second goal, uh, I, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still a folk hero in uh, Borussia because of it, because it was an OG from me. And this lad chipped it. I, I had first seen he was going to chip it, and I, I thought, it was going to hit the bar and go over. Instead, it hit the crossbar, came down, hit me in the chest, 
and went in the net, in, and that was the winning goal. Defeated again, yet invincible at home. The 1966 championship side was one of the finest teams Bill Shankly ever produced. With the cop as 12th man, they seemed unbeatable. I think that the team in the mid 60s is at its best. We had 12 players. Jeff Strong was the 12th one who was in and out. I think they were the best team that's been in this country since the war. I don't, I'm not, I don't think so. I'm certain of it. Not because it was Liverpool. But they, they were unbeatable. I think we won it with 14 players that year. Um, and it's always nice to do something very, very simply. You know, it's, it's funny, you know, spectators and supporters used to say, did you ever get injured at Liverpool? I said, yeah, but, you know, we're always back the next day. And, and that was how it was. You were frightened, you know, to, to, to have a bad injury because it, it took you two years to get back. The 66 championship strike force of Ian St. John and Roger Hunt terrorised the fences. Callaghan, going past Boyce, a beautiful little chip, Hunt, and a goal! We always thought Roger could score a goal, and if I could keep them out, or the, the striker who I was playing against, keep him from scoring, we'd win this game. And that's how I went through most of the games, you know. And uh, Roger didn't let us down, I could assure you. And away they go. The following season, Liverpool launched an assault on the European Cup again. In the second round, they were drawn to play Johan Cruyff's Ajax in a fog-bound Amsterdam. We believed we could beat anybody. We went to play Ajax. Ruben Bellet had the job of going to have a look at the opposition. And now Ajax were an emerging young team with Cruyff and Liskins and all those guys in it. Ruben would come back and Shanks, and the, you know, he's got us in the little room at the training ground with the board, you know, and the men on the board. And now, boys, this is the European Cup, and this is it, you know. This is what we play for, you know. So he's given all of the hype. And Ruben then chimes in, he says, I, and they're not a bad side. Ruben, we're not interested in them, he says. <laughs> so Ruben, who had been away for a week, get this dossier, never got a word done. They were an up-and-coming team. We didn't realise they were so good. Uh, the night we played them, it was foggy. And um, we got beef 5 1. But believe it or not, and th this is not just a fairy tale, the guy, I was right half, so the, the guy who played outside right for them, he was actually so far over the touchline when he crossed a couple of balls which he scored from, we'd actually stopped. And the fellow had put the ball in the net, and then the referee could not see. It was very foggy, and uh, <coughs> there was a well known referee, he, he said, play. And, they, and of course went to play and you couldn't see the game at all wow. i was on the pitch the referee never saw me oh, we, were, we were down to nothing you see so i went down to the, the field to tell them uh, and the referee never even saw me shanks at one stage actually come on the pitch <laughs> he's going bobby bobby do you know they tell them what to do they go hey, okay boys you know now we're into injury time And they scored, have they? I think they've got a goal. I got us. They couldn't tell you who it was. There isn't even time to kick off. So the final score, Ajax of Amsterdam 5, Liverpool 1 in the first leg. Of course, his famous line after it when the press were waiting for the coach, you know. What did you think, Bill? Nah, nah, we can never play against defensive teams. In hindsight, you know, Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley, they were learning all the time. And obviously, they learned from our mistakes. I mean the team mistakes, you know, what they did, you know. Uh, and, you know, as, as you can see, you know, they won four European Cups. Uh, unfortunately, after we had finished, most of us, most of our team anyway. Shankly's 60s team would never conquer Europe, but graduates of the old school like Tommy Smith would. At the end of the decade, Shanks built a new team revolving around the evergreen, Ian Callaghan. Callaghan will attempt to put it into execution, and very nearly succeeded. Keegan does! Hughes to Callaghan, who lets go! Callie was brilliant. I mean, he was so underrated, it was, it was embarrassing, you know. Uh, he should have had a lot more caps than he did. Callaghan was the one player to supply the entire Shankly era. 
But partway through in 1970, the great man was planning major changes. The time had come to enlist new men. I remember Emlyn Hughes, uh, I saw him playing his first game for Blackburn, incidentally. It was at Blackburn, the end of the season, and he had, it was his first outing at left back, and Sunday season he was about 18. And uh, I said, good God. Uh, so I tried to send him after the match. That was after he played one game. I offered him a, a, a fee for him, and it took me two years before I got him. In 1970, Ray Clements arrived. Ray Clements, who's the best goalkeeper in the world. There isn't any doubt about that. Summerby, again one of those well-flighted crosses. What a superb save by Clements from Lee. He nearly broke Alec Lindsay's leg one day in a flying tackle. He could have broke his own leg as well. I said, I'm, I'm not taking you for the sake of Alec Lindsay or anybody else. Ray. I'm taking you for your own sake. You may break your own legs. But uh, he, he toned down a bit. But uh, that wasn't bad. I mean, that was good. I'm looking for players that will fight when there's nothing at stake. So that's what we're talking about, actual enthusiasm. Bell, and they caught those back four square this time. Lee, good save again by Clements. What a goalkeeper this man is. Ray deserved more caps than what he got, because I know Peter Shilton was a good goalkeeper, and I played with Peter Shilton at England level, but he, he was not as good as Ray Clements. Clem was tremendous. Greatest goalkeeper I've ever seen. He's in the same class as... Uh, uh, Gordon Banks, there's no question about that. You know, Banks, he was the greatest I've ever seen. Followed by Clem, but real good goalkeepers. Next, Bill broke the club record when he invested £100,000 in a tower of a forward called John Toshak. It was to be the start of a beautiful relationship. Keegan letting a run on for Toshak. And it's allowed. The highway. That's a good ball for Keegan's head, and Tushak! What a beauty! The supply line for the new attack was to be provided by that most articulate of wingers, university graduate Steve Highway. Eats them to Highway, and the buzz begins again. Highway using his stride. A the Highway doesn't know it's there, but he's found it now. Yes! Steve Highway joined us from an amateur team, and... Um, he joined in 1970. Well, you see, he, he got, well, again, every player was watched in training, and he, he had always had this enthusiasm for the game, great skill, and um, he, he got drafted into the, the, into the first team squad quite early. We went to the FA Cup final in 1971, and it was, that was the team that was changing. You know, out had gone Big Eatsy, um, Roger Hunting, St. John, all those players, even Peter Thompson and everything, were just starting to make way for the new era of Steve Highway, Brian Hall, Peter Cormack, um, and Kevin Keegan was to come in uh, just after that. But uh, as I said, Larry Lloyd, Ray Clements. So these, these players were very, very young. And it was, it, was, it was, you could say, a difficult time. But these boys had learned the trade in the reserves, and, and they were ready. The final piece of the jigsaw was the signing of Kevin Keegan from Scunthorpe for £35,000. So 20 minutes of this game gone without a goal, but a bit more life and promise in it lately as Keegan comes in, number one. <laughs> Kevin Keegan made that look a lot easier than it was. John Dubiti and then uh, Peter Doherty, they'd been watching this uh, on behalf of another club for nine months because he, he lived in Nottingham and the Scunthorpe's quite close. And this club, they, he was putting him, but ramming him down a short, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't sing him. So when he came to me, I, I didn't hesitate at all. And when I heard the, for, uh, that Preston had made their offer, uh, we had to go in. How much? Uh, 35,000 pounds. Preston, I think, we heard that offer 25, I couldn't tell you. But they'd made an offer. He'd done the initial training. The Tuesday before it would be the practice match. Played in the big team. Goes an awful lot of havoc. And that was the end of it. So on the Thursday I said to him, you like to play in the team? Oh, I said, oh, yeah. I said, I said, okay, you play. And he opened up against Nottingham Forest. He won the game. He scored a goal, made a goal. It was a bit of a fluke, the one he scored. But he scored it nevertheless. And uh, he, that was something. He never was out of the team. Smith. Keegan going in. Not 
nothing wrong with that one. The rebuilding of the team was complete. The changes paid off in the 1973 championship season. Well cut out though. Right corner, he dropped that well. Kevin Keegan on the right. Toshak goes over to the middle. Highway racing into the middle too. Keegan. And here's Evelyn Hughes picking up the loose one. Oh, and Hughes has got it! Kevin Keegan chasing this one. Oh, doing so well. Great balance. High weight. Tomac! What a misdirected headers from both sides. And here's Keegan as Webb misses his kick. Gives it to Toshak, and Toshak gets it in. Highway, bursting on it. Highway, jinking round, with space for a shot, and a goal! Yes, indeed. Callaghan. Keegan coming round, and Toshak's there. Goalkeeper didn't know which one to watch. Boy. Toshak did that well. Cormac. Keegan. Oh, what a beautiful goal! Highway, taking it well on his body. And then sweeping past McDowell. Brilliant there. Keegan, a superb goal! Keegan taking off Nish. Toshak! Paul. Horsma. Oh, he did that well! In the final home game against Leicester, the Copites were hanging up their decorations in anticipation of the point needed for Shankly's third league championship. Highways cross, dangerous. Thompson to Keegan. Great save by Shilton. But out for a corner by Whitman. Callaghan's cross. Horsmer inside to Highway. Come to Callaghan. Hughes. Good ball to Thompson. And back again to Hughes. This could be it. No, it's not. Stringfellow. And there's the whistle. And Liverpool are champions. And out comes the trophy, which is awarded to the league champions, already bearing the red colours of Liverpool. And now the salute for the champions and for Bill Shankly, who takes off his jacket to reveal a characteristic red shirt. This is the man they love. The cop rise, and Shankly responds. A great day for him. And a great, great day for them. And here go the champions. To accept the homage of their supporters and to pay their respects to the crowds who carry them along. Uh, a policeman down at the cop end, you know, he, he, nothing can be said to him. There was that many scarves coming on. But I can remember him just kicking it away and pushing it into the dirt a little bit. And Shanks came over and pushed him away. He said, Hey, he said, that's somebody's life. He says, Don't be kicking that. People pay good money for that. He said, That's people's lifeblood. Give me it here. And he picked it up and he put it around his neck. And that was the way he was, the affection that he had for people. Last Saturday was the greatest of all of them. Winning it early on was a novelty. But last Saturday, because it was a new team, and they had worked so hard for so long and got pipped last season, and pipped the season before in the cup final, that we had gone again for the third time, with far more satisfaction, and definitely the greatest moment I had in, in football. Since I come here, to Liverpool, and to Anfield, I have drummed it into our players time and again that they are privileged to play for you. And if they didn't believe me, they believe me now. As a young boy, as a young apprentice at the time, um, you know, if you'd come from another part of the country, he was still a great man.
But when you've been in Liverpool far as I was, and I've come here every day, every word he spoke to you was 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 magnificent. He used to say the same thing in those days. It was, you know, hey son, did you sleep well last night? Are you eating the right stuff? Those are the same things. And I'd go back and I'd tell my mum exactly the same thing, more or less every day. She, did he speak to you? Oh yeah, he spoke to me today. Oh yeah, he said exactly the same things. But it, it was fantastic because he, he took care of everybody. It wasn't just necessarily the first team. He 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 worried about the well-being of, of all the young boys, that they were, they were living right. And it was great. But just to be here and be part of it and the great man speaking to you day after day. Great feeling. After the title win, Anfield staged the first leg of the UEFA Cup final against Borussia Mönchengladbach. Brian Hall played. They didn't play big, John. Played the, sm the small men. A terrible torrential rain and the ground was flooded. He took the players off half an hour after the game started. And I said, thank God for that, you see. So I said to John Toshak, you go home, John, and get to bed, I said. And you can get ready for tomorrow night. And uh, because the, the defence was, wasn't was very good in the air and, and stayed in the box. So we just, uh, John come on the next night and we pumped the high balls into the box and flicked them on and in no time at all, it's 3 nothing and the game's all over. Shaq, Keegan. Oh, what a beautiful goal! What a goal! In the first leg, Liverpool achieved a 3-0 win. They were halfway to their first European trophy. Now they had to defend their lead in Germany, but that wouldn't be easy. I was captain of the side and, and didn't realise how, how much pressure that they could put on us. Liverpool making a mistake in defence. The first 20 minutes. We got battered. We got absolutely murdered. Well, he's got past Lloyd and Smith. Heinkes. Oh, and there's a goal. Heinkes. And Liverpool are in trouble. A big inside left called Gunter Netzer. Oh, we ran riot. And um, we were two down after 20 minutes, and I rallied the troops. And we got to grips with the game. And, and by the second half, they, 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 I think they brought on a substitution. And we could have scored maybe one or two goals. But what we did do is stopped the flow and we, we did a, not so much a rear guard thing as, as we played a sensible game for, for, for like 70 minutes and we, that, that's what won us and when I came off uh, the boss was more than happy because we'd got beaten 2-0 you know, but we'd won the, won the thing on 3-2 you know. We scored like lightning, we're down 2 nothing in no time and I thought Chris we're going to beat 10 nothing. Yeah, that Wimmer and Danner and Netzer and this little centre forward were ripping us to part but they're in themselves out. And just before half time, you could see the steam had gone out of them. And whilst we were tired, because we'd played more games than them, they were more tired. And at the end of the day, I said at half time, I said, we might even get a draw in this match. And we, we got the score finished 2 nothing, which we'd won in a total aggregate of 3-2. Liverpool have won the European Their first major conquest in Europe after nine years of... I was knackered. This thing weighed half a ton, you know. I remember a big lad from Liverpool throwing his arms around my neck and me effing and blinding at him saying, oh, if you don't get off me, I'll whack you with this. I couldn't even lift it to tell, to tell you the truth. And, and I remember going back in the dressing room and just plunking it on the boss's knee. He was sat on the stairs. I said, here, get hold of that. He was more than happy. 1973 was the best season Liverpool had with Bill Shankly. The UEFA Cup and another league championship. The fans worshipped him. The players revered him. My fourth game for Liverpool, or fifth game, was against West Ham United at Anfield. I'd scored in my debut after 30 minutes, bobbled one in off my shin. I'd got uh, another couple of goals, and suddenly people were talking about me, you know, and I think he felt that maybe I was feeling a bit of pressure of that. And uh, we're playing West Ham, and it's Bobby Moore, it's Jeff Hurst, it's Martin Peters, it's the World Cup winning team. It, you know, tremendous respect. And uh, he used to wait at the door, or just down the passage, and he always watched the other team come in always it was a ritual and he'd say hello boys how are you and all that you know but he was watching every move looking for the ones who were limping you know and he came into me and he sat down he said uh, hey son he said i've just seen that bobby moore what a wreck he said uh, he's got big bags under his eyes uh, he's limping he's got dandruff and 
he's been out to a nightclub again, son. Because uh, just before that, they had this incident at the Blackpool at the nightclub, you know, the whole West Ham team. And suddenly, you know, from maybe feeling a bit of pressure, I was playing against this uh, old geezer who'd got dandruff, who'd been out all night and was limping. And of course, uh, went out and played, and we beat them 4-1. They played fantastic. Bobby Moore was brilliant. And I happened to get a goal against him, but I mean, he, he probably that day was one of, one of the best performances I've ever seen of anyone I played against. So he came in and he said to me, hey son, he said, he's some player that Bobby Moore, isn't he? He said, you'll never play against anyone better than him. The Anfield supporters look forward to winning the big prize, the European Cup. Liverpool met Red Star Belgrade in the second round. It was a watershed. That was also to be, of course, Bill Sinclair's last European game, Red Star. We weren't to know it then, but uh, they, um, they beat Liverpool and knocked Liverpool out. And Shanks was never again to manage Liverpool in Europe. on for Lazarevich. Beautiful goal! That's done it! Something to be added on, but not a great deal. Oh, yes! What a tremendous shot from Jankovic! It was a chilling exhibition by the Yugoslav team. Miljan Miljanic was the manager then. And, um... It, it caused great consternation at Anfield and there were boot room powwows deep into the night and they decided the time had come where they had to abandon the up to then accepted way of playing defensive football and they had to have a guy who could play and start it all from the back. A new style of football came to Liverpool. You know, Alt had gone, you know, sort of Big e. and Larry Lloyd, big dominant centre-halves and we'd come in and Emlyn and myself, who were more ball-playing centre-backs, I think we changed the face, not only of Liverpool football, although, you know, obviously I, I can't take anything away from Smithies and Utes, because they were a great team, a powerful team, playing some great stuff. But we seem to bring a new dimension, a new dimension to English football. Later managers would benefit from Shanky's experiences, but he was preparing his final word. The 1974 FA Cup final was to be his farewell performance. And now a chance for Keegan, and that's it! Kevin Keegan has scored for Liverpool. A backheader there by Toshak now for Highway. Number two, Steve Highway. Kevin Keegan trying his tricks, and there's the floating cross again. Tommy Smith almost arrogantly putting it there for Brian Hall. Back again for Tommy Smith. Turned inside for Highway. Playing it again for Smith. What a good move. Oh, and yes, it's there by Keegan, his second goal, and what a move that led to it. So Liverpool, who narrowly failed in the league championship, win the FA Cup. He could have had anything he wanted at Liverpool, yet Bill Shankly had had enough. It is with great regret that Mr Shankly has intimated that he wishes to retire from active participation in league football. I've never known a press conference so still and quiet. It, it was like a church, the silence. And there's Bill sort of, um, obviously the emotions must have been racing through him. And uh, it was just sensational. Uh, I got told later on that uh, from the secretary, Peter Robinson, that he used to do this thing every year. Maybe it was after an edge, you know, to maybe get a rise and pray or something. I don't really know. But what he did do, he, he used to say, oh, I've had enough. And then the summer would come which he hated because there was no football and by the time the pre-season had come he would be back at the club saying okay I'll sign for you again you know and, and it, but this time he was adamant that he'd had enough he wanted to spend a bit more time with his wife Jesse and, and the kids and, and you know he sort of just left and uh, you know we'd all been down for the cup final won the cup final and no inkling and then um, I was out with the wife shopping in, in town and uh, the, the news agents Svenders were out and the shouting was going on. Bill Shankley's resigned and the wife said, I want to, that's probably someone, a bit of a gimmick. But anyway, we got the paper and he'd resigned. It's true, I, I, I swear it's the truth. Uh, Honestly, I'm that. not joking, really. Uh, what happened to son? Nah, I don't believe that. If he has, like, Liverpool's had it. Oh, you wouldn't have me crying. 
He's retired. He's finished. He's leaving oh, the game. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> you haven't been on it, you? No, I'm not having it. I've just been, been to Anfield, honest. You said? When did he retire? Today. He retired. He's finished today. Terrible, um, terrible. Have you ever, Shank is retired. Is he? He's finished. Bit of a shock for me. How do you feel? Terrible. Then, have you heard today's news? Shank is retiring. Is he? Yeah, what do you think of that? Thank Christ for that. Not too, um, you're an Everton supporter, then? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, the most difficult decision ever made to, to leave uh, to decide to leave the club eventually. I mean, uh, possibly it was like going to the electric chair. That's the way I had the feeling I had. The people of Liverpool said goodbye to their beloved Shanks, the Scotsman they had taken as one of their own. Bob Paisley was Shankly's assistant. Bill did the talking and Bob did the listening. He had joined Liverpool from Bishop Auckland before the Second World War. The club encouraged him to study physiotherapy, but when they asked him to succeed Bill Shankly, he was reluctant. Being given this job, like he said, it's like being given the Queen Elizabeth to steer in the Force 10 gale. And whereas Shanks could help to put it over himself, uh, and whereas Bob couldn't, Bob had Joe and, and Ronnie who could, who could put that over better ways than, than he could. But of course, they, they'd worked with him long enough and knew his mannerisms. And he said, I've been down in me bended knee to Bill. Go and have a cruise. Go on a holiday and come back and you have your job back. I'll just look after the shop like while you're away. But he won't have it, so I've got it, haven't I? And I thought I was the buffer. And, uh, and I, would, uh, I would willingly do that type of thing when, when I took off and that. And uh, what's happened since is nobody's business. <laughs> Bill's game was all about passion. Bob was all about patience. Bill never liked defending, but Bob saw the Europeans turn defence into attack, and he adjusted the team accordingly. He didn't try to change the structures of the team in any way. He, he'd bring in another little piece of the jigsaw. One was maybe getting a bit rough around the edges, so it'd need just a little bit of changing. And he'd look to bring a player in who would just fit in. Maybe not the, the most gifted player in the world, but somebody who would fit into the jigsaw and to just make things uh, tick along. Here's Hall. Smith. Hall takes the return and hits the shot and cases it for his country. Under Bob Paisley, the football became a little bit more uh, possession-like. Most training sessions comprised of, uh, of keep ball, you know, just constantly give and move, give and move. Um, I mean, that was really the, the, the success of the 70s. A Paisley masterstroke was to accommodate one of Shankly's last signings, the Arsenal striker Ray Kennedy, who was developing all the signs of being a disgruntled misfit. By chance, Paisley got talking to Kennedy's old school teacher, who mentioned that the young striker started out as a left-sided midfielder. Kennedy on the left foot, which is his good foot, and it's in! Well, clever little nod off for Kennedy! Oh! to Kennedy. Dermot through the middle. Fair class. And Doug Leash let it run for Lee. Superb move by Liverpool. Ray, Ray Kennedy was one of the best moves that I ever made. I think if I was to have a census from the European clubs in that period, there would be a few who would be voted for him. He also signed Terry McDermott, who played against Liverpool in the 1974 FA Cup final. Johnson. And Johnson the ball into acres of empty space for Highway. And Highway, a brilliant crossback. McDermott, it was, who finished it. I was like to Terry Mack and uh, Ray Kennedy. It took them a little, little bit of time to settle in. And, and, and they come good in the end, because it is a little bit different. It is a bit different. It is hard. I remember saying to Graeme Souness when he, when he came, uh, you know, he, he, he come from Middlesbrough, and he was here and everything, and Graeme was a bit of a, you know, confident boy and everything. I said, hey, I said, we play for keeps now. I said, this is keeps, week in, week out. I said, it's hard, and it's every game. Paisley's approach was nothing short of a revolution. 
The system combined the control of the Continental passing game with the aggression and work rate of the British game. By his second season in charge, Liverpool were ahead of the rest. It would be years before the others caught up with them. Next, he beat the Europeans at their own game. Phil Neal was signed by Paisley and played in the UEFA Cup semi-final in Barcelona. He laid the, the rules down as if to say, well, OK, we'll keep the opposition quiet. We'll do that by plenty of passing. And if we deny the opposition a scoring chance over the first half, you'll feel that the opposition's fans are getting fidgety towards, hang on, we're not in front, we're at home. You know, we should be in front. And it worked like a dream. Everything went exactly as planned. Liverpool travelled to the new Camp and soaked up the pressure. John Toshak scored the only goal of the game to stun the Barcelona supporters. We won the game 1-0 and as a full-time whistle went, I, uh, all these cushions came out of the stand. So I, I got up out of the, the dugout and threw them back and I was whizzing them like frisbees and they were bouncing off these Spaniards' heads. And I was getting knackered, I had to go under my leg, round my back and I had them bouncing off the uh, Barcelona fans' heads, and I remember Bob Paisley grabbing me by the, the collar and shouting, saying, you know, what do you think you're doing? And I said, well, I'm not having them throwing cushions at us. And he said, they're not throwing at us, they're throwing at them because we beat them, you know. <laughs> Liverpool had cause for celebration once more when the league returned to Anfield in 1976. Well, he's got to be manager of the year. I mean, who else can beat him now? I mean, there's nobody. Nobody at all. The only fellow who can possibly do him is this fellow up in Scotland. But our, our league's a hell of a lot harder league to win. But in the final of the UEFA Cup, it's, 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 it's got to be manager of the year. I don't care what anybody says. This is my proudest moment being at Liverpool, that I'm a dear manager, that they won the championship, which is the greatest competition in the world. And I'm proud to be a Liverpoolian tonight, I can assure you. To win the league in 75, 76 was just fantastic, you know, because we, it, it had been uh, 72, 73 since we'd won it. It had been a couple of years, and it was nice to win it again. You know, you, you win it every year, and, and, and fans get a bit blasé, and maybe players do, and that was just, that brought back all the memories of it and the real passion and 42 games and concentration and... It was great, but you felt something was really happening, something special again. In the same year, Liverpool also won the UEFA Cup for a second time. The hard work was done in the first leg at Anfield. Over the heads of the defenders, and Lombard chasing and scoring! Turn by Lakens to the Cuba. Cooper gets it back from Kuz, Lombard, Kuz, 2-0! Stein scored a little bit out of position by Keegan, highway. Bringing in Kennedy, great goal! Keegan turning brilliantly, Kennedy again, and Case! 2-2! Not away by Fandera, by Takuba. Highway. Going past Bastines. Penalty! Goalkeeper is off his line. Mr. Biversi is saying to him, go back. And Keegan comes up now. And sends it the wrong way! No matter what anybody tells you about Europe, the UEFA Cup's the hardest to win. There might be the glory in the European Cup, but that UEFA Cup, you're playing home and you're playing away and you're playing extra games because there's more teams in it because they are up and coming teams in the, in, the, in the appropriate leagues throughout Europe. And we had some hard games in that, I can tell you. In 1977, Liverpool retained the league title and David Fairclough became a household name. Back off going for the left foot. Club. Kennedy up well, Keegan! On the European front, Liverpool prepared for a quarter-final that would live long in the memory, the return leg against favourites, Saint-Étienne. It was the biggest night at Anfield since Inter Milan had arrived on Merseyside 
12 years earlier. That was a game people still talked about, and one young boy had sampled the occasion in the streets outside. I grew up on minding cars around the, uh, the Anfield area and on a Saturday, you know, and then creeping in at uh, three quarter time and then getting back out of the ground quickly to get your money for, for having minded the cars, you know. David Fairclough dreamt of being a hero on the cop. It came true. Strange sense at the end because you just sensed that something extraordinary was going to happen. It just by, the, by appearing up on the Anfield Road uh, before the game in the coach and just ahead of you, you could just see masses and masses of people and you just felt, how was the coach going to get through there? The thing I remember of that night is walking behind the Anfield Road end and St Etienne had brought a great following with him. There were people with uh, the worst French accents I've ever heard because once the cop was closed, there were so many people going round there and trying to get in that end and some of them were getting through but the police were sussing other ones out. I'd never seen so many flags. It was just incredible, and there were a few red flares in there, and they were very colourful. It was all green and white, and I, I began to get a few nerves, actually, in the old, uh, in the old stomach. One nil down from the first game, Liverpool needed to win by two clear goals at home. Keegan. Djokovic has missed it! After my shot swerved and goes in. I remember Bob came down and, and just sort of said, usually he just sort of popped his head around the, the side of the, the uh, dugout and just sort of said, go and have a run up and down and, uh, you know, get ready for it. As I'm warming up, Ray Kennedy uh, got the, the second for us. And Toshek going after it. Kennedy, two two. Liverpool live again. Losses, uh, normal orders were get out there, just uh, get a piece of something, you know, see if you can turn this one. And I didn't really have much time to think of what was at stake. I was sitting there in the hospital and I was lying there and the match was on the radio and I can remember it actually Elton Wellesby. You know, his words went, Liverpool look as though they might have lost it now. I don't, it looks as though it, the game is going away from them. Here's Ray Kennedy with the ball. He passes it forward. He passes it forward to David Fairclough. David Fairclough's going on. And he scored. He scored. And I went, yes, 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 screaming. It really does look at the moment if time is going to beat Liverpool. Time and the away goal rule. Larke turning it in. Hervé Ravelli's there. Tommy Smith wins the aerial duel. And Jimmy Case gets it away down the middle. Too many long balls, I feel, by Liverpool. Ray Kennedy had, had said to me, if ever he was in doubt, he would lob a ball into those areas. Hopeful balls at the moment. There's another one from Kennedy, but that could break for fair. I love that situation with a lot of fresh air in front of me, uh, you know, and, and the goal there. I mean, that was all I ever, all I ever needed, really. But that could break for fair, club in fact. I just remember thinking, let's not do nothing silly. Just make sure I get the ball on target. And it does, Beckler's going through, and he scores! And my hero, Roger Hunt, used to always used to run away and just sort of leap into the air, and uh, I didn't know what to do. It was just the case. I think it was the first time I had ever done it, and uh, normally I used to just turn away uh, when I scored. But on that occasion, I just felt so wonderful. Super sub! Once again! All the players sort of ended up on top of that corner, and... Well, anybody that was on the court that night, where you were standing when Fairclough hit that winning goal and where you were standing when the celebrations were over two minutes later, I'll guarantee there's nobody that was uh, any less than about 20 or 30 yards away from where they'd started. Liverpool cruised through the semi-final and Bob Paisley was on his way to Rome for the second time. Uh, Rome was a place that I'd been to during the war and, and, and that and they had a particular fancy for the, the whole city and that and... Uh, the setting of the game and the weather, uh, the, the supporters, they'd gone out there to enjoy themselves and they, be, they, they were immaculate in the behaviour and, uh, and the game and the performance that we did to win it. It was recognised throughout Europe and that had to be the, the best moment of my life. As the team left for Rome, Bob Paisley had the daunting task of lifting his players. FA Cup final defeat three days earlier to Manchester United was a devastating blow, 
but the supporters rallied round their heroes by following them en masse to Italy, and spirits were soon improving as the players left Speak Airport to scenes reminiscent of the Beatles going to America. And to lose playing against Manchester United at Wembley, when we should have won, we played them off the park. It was hard to sort of to digest, to take that in. And it showed the character within the squad as it was there. Because everybody pulled together. It wasn't just the, what, the 11 who were playing. Everybody pulled together to make sure, hey, we were going in the right direction. We were now disciplined. We drowned our sorrows on the Saturday. And hey, now we're focused. We're going to win that. The players had been cocooned in the hills. As the team entered the stadium, the first thing to take in was this magnificent arena. The second thing, the cup. Well, I've still got the banner, and I think as much of that banner as I do the European Cup medal. There were over 20,000 Liverpool supporters in Rome. They outnumbered the Germans. It must have felt like a home game. There was no way Liverpool could lose. A lot of people wouldn't have, they wouldn't know they were in Rome that night, but uh, I don't... I don't regret that. I, I wanted to savour every every moment of, of that occasion. And that, and, uh, you know, inwardly, I was drunk, but I didn't take a drink for the simple reason I just wanted to savour every moment. The champagne was going all over the place. It was like 20 Formula One winners had all got in together and opened the champagne. It was spraying all over the place. Jimmy Tarbuck was there. And there was all, all kind of fans had found out where we were. Our whole place was going. And there's a little figure sitting on his own in the corner. I was Bob Paisley. And a few of us went home. and said, Bob, you're right. I said, I'm just savouring every moment of it. Every moment. He said, the last time I was here was in a 1000-weight truck in the army. He said, we beat the Germans that night and we've beaten them again. And he was just so chuffed. He said, there's only two people sober in Rome tonight, me and the Pope. I always remember Kevin's game, because Kevin, Kevin came in for a lot of criticism after the FA Cup final. But it showed him, on a personal note, things that I've all, I always knew about him, and I know even more now as an England manager, what a tremendous character and personality he is, because he performed magnificently on that night. Magnificently. It was to be Keegan's last game for the club. His replacement, Kenny Dalglish, signed from Celtic for £500,000, became Bob Paisley's most influential signing. This hit, but it's gone Dalglish, and he turns and scores! Dermot put in by Highway, and the chest down by Perriman dropped nicely for Dalglish, and now Kennedy, and soon as Kenny turn on it, pulled it back for Case, Dalglish! It's Highway with the corner. And surely, well, eventually, Dalglish has got it. Case. And Dalglish is in the clear. And Dalglish slots in a super little goal. Oh, so easy. Dalglish, I'm quite sure which way he'll turn. And got it back onto his left foot. Watson. Dalglish. Wheeling is the Liverpool player jumping. Dalglish collects. I've always said the best signing the club has ever made, in my opinion, was Kenny Dalglish. Kevin was probably more of an individualist than Kenny. Kenny was, was one of these players who we played into, into uh, Kenny's feet. Kenny was not as quick as, as Kevin, but you could play the ball into Kenny's feet, and this is when we started getting even more movement off Kenny's ability to hold up the ball. And I think it was Ronnie Moran who I remember um, his words was, get the ball into his feet around the box, get it into his feet, and he drummed it into us. And, you know, it was, it was fantastic. He was so strong, upper body strength was fantastic. In September, World Cup winners Osvaldo Ardiles and Ricardo Villa witnessed the awesome power of Liverpool at first hand. Ray Kennedy. Case. This hit, but it's gone Dalglish, and he turns and scores! Dermot put in by Highway, and the chest down by Perriman dropped nicely for Dalglish, and now Kennedy, and soon as Kenny turn on it, pulled it back for Case, Dalglish! Johnson on for McDermott. Ray Kennedy in the middle, the ball with Dalglish, and now Johnson, Sunis, 
Doglish did well to turn on the shot. Johnson, 4-0. And now his Doglish put away by Ray Kennedy. Doglish for Johnson, number five. and Johnson the ball into acres of empty space for Highway and Highway a brilliant cross back McDermott it was who finished it and what a classic goal so they've came to Anfield with all these uh, wonderful things accolades going after going to do this going to do that and they've come against come up against the Liverpool team who were so up for the game because of the hype over our dealers and via and we gave them an absolute batter the quality of the performances have been the best certainly in my three championships liverpool won the 1979 championship with a record number of points amazingly they conceded only 16 goals i believe that was the very best liverpool team that there's been and i don't care what people can say about you know even in the the 80s and 90s or whatever even when they won the double that was something Incredible that had aggression, that had movement, that had goal scorers from all positions. In 81, Liverpool won the League Cup for the first time in their history. It was the start of a record breaking run of four successive cup wins. And he's gone past Alan Hansen, and he's got a couple of West Ham players waiting in the middle. The cross coming in, oh, and it's there. Well, Goddard has put West Ham. It's Phil Neal. And West Ham have certainly got plenty back. Still playing it in. Douglish! So Liverpool's corner. Jimmy Case with it. Curled it there once more towards Hansen. And the goal! The faces at Liverpool changed, but the system remained the same. It wasn't always easy to adapt. Most clubs still relied on the long ball game. Not here. All of a sudden, Ray Kennedy came short, uh, Graham Sooners came short, and I'd go wallop and hit it 50 yards away, and they'd go, uh-oh. They got to me in a way and said, listen, Alan, Liverpool's play is to play possession. In 81, Liverpool also reached the European Cup final, a glamorous final against Real Madrid in Paris. Alan Kennedy was the unlikely hero. Ray Kennedy had the ball, and Alan went on one of his mazes. He, 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 I don't know, he got a nosebleed when he went over, and he, Ray's thrown it into him. I, I didn't know what I was doing, I'll be honest with you. I was making a run forward, and if the ball came to me, great. If it didn't, well, I might have created a little bit of space. And I'm at the far post, and I'm shouting for it because I'm clear. And he's, I could see him thinking about it, whether he should pass to me or... I wasn't quite sure, and I have to be honest about this, I, I wasn't quite sure whether it was a shot or a cross. I would like to think it was a shot. And he shot, and of course he scored. And I've, uh, he's took off to the, behind the goal, and he's gone headed straight for the our end where all the supporters were, and he's there. Because it must have taken the, the lads at least a couple of minutes to get to me. I was, I was so quick in those days. And I'm the first person to, and I've grabbed him, and I've said, they said, you've scored the goal, you've scored the goal, and do you greedy sod? And that's the first thing I said to him, you should have passed to me. And he looked at me and said, I only had two choices. Either shoot myself or pass to you. He said, I think I made the right choice. <laughs> I put the European cut in this big velvet uh, bag, um, tied the top on it, put it in my boot, in my capri, and off I went to my local in Kirby. 
and I got in there, took the European Cup out the bag, and took it into the pub, and all, all the mates and everything, because I used to run the Sunday League team in the Falcon, um, and I had some great times, and so that's where, obviously, was our base, so I took the European Cup in there, and nobody could believe it. Bob Paisley's retreat from the spotlight was the sanctuary of the famous boot room. The lads have taken it over and uh, now it's, you know, it's a legend, that boot room. It was called a boot room because all the match boots were, were, were hung up at the bottom of the room. And then the same policy when I invite the, the opposition in after the game, not talk about the game, what went on during the actual day, talk about other things, about playing against one another in our days or you know, just talking generally about the game. Sooners getting it back though from Whelan. Good turn from Dalglish, he's passed Reinders and Rush. Back in 1980, Paisley signed a young forward from Chester City called Ian Rush. He would go on to break many goal-scoring records, but in 1981, he couldn't get a game. He told me I should be more selfish. And I said, well, I thought Liverpool was a team game. He said, oh yeah, but at the end of the day, you're a striker, you're there to score goals and nothing else at the moment. He said, the rest of your game should come on later. He said, you're not in the team, and he put me on the transfer list, which, uh, I, you know, as later on you found out, he never put me on the transfer list. And uh, it was unbelievable. Next thing I went out for reserves, I think I scored five goals in two games, and that's when I got my break. The Liverpool machine rolled on. In 1982, Liverpool won the league again and reached another League Cup final. He's hardly had a touch since he came on. Dalgleish couldn't get to it, but he might get to this. Villa going in there, using his shoulder. Johnson playing it in. Whelan! Well, that was our dealer's mistake, and it's Rush. And now it's Dalgleish. He's onside. Is this the decisive moment? He's played for Whelan, and he's done it again. Astonishing the first time he's ever played at Wembley, and he's got two of the goals. No, it falls for Sammy Lee. And what about that for a ball? Inviting Ian Rush to make a charge, to take it round Price, to play it for David Johnson. Stopped by Clements, but it's not away yet. Rush! 3 1. tremendous feeling then but as like as like before you know where we, you had a feeling that you're going to come back to Wembley every year even if it was for a charity shield or to play in the cup and you had, just had that feeling in you we're going to come back here again and I want to score I think I want to score at Wembley again in 1983 Bob Paisley announced he would retire at the end of the season after Liverpool had won the League Cup for the third time the players insisted Paisley collect the trophy it was a gesture that illustrated the affection in which he was held Bob Paisley didn't say a lot, and he just got on with his own own job. He's like a working class person who's he's been out, he knew everything about the game, and uh, I was a bit sorry to see him go because he dealt me so much as well. It's only little things he'd say to me. Uh, he wouldn't get you in a room and talk to you for half an hour. Little things he'd say to me, but what he said, he was 100 percent right. He was craftier than Shanks, and he was more cunning. I think, if if you ask me the difference, that's what I would say. Although that might be a surprise to some people, but. Bob's native cunning was came from his the soles of his feet right through. He, he, he was like a stick of rock, cunning and crafty was all the way through him. In football terms, lovely, lovely, genuine man, but in football terms, very crafty, very cunning. You don't even dream about these things. I'm quite sure of that. The rare I don't know what I've won now, really. <laughs> uh, no, no way, no way. You don't even dream about. Joe Fagan became the Liverpool manager. It was a change, but nothing altered. Liverpool went on winning trophies. Joe was a, a, a vital part of the machine when we were winning the things before he became manager. And the same with Bob with Shanks and Ronnie with Joe. Everybody played the part. And it was uh, Joe, because Joe was only there a short time, he never got the, the recognition what he did. And Joe just did exactly what Bob did, was kept things ticking over kept things ticking over and was a very shrewd man, 
very, very clever man, and picked the right players to come into the team again. Rough edges and part of the jigsaw. Time to move on, bring somebody else in. It's the way it went on. I mean, Joe's second year, he got a treble, and that's very rarely mentioned. The League Cup was won against old rivals Everton, the first part of the treble. Sunis. And a goal! Sunis for Liverpool. Graham Souness would lift three trophies that year. It was his last season as a player at Liverpool before moving to Italy. He had been a tremendous servant. Lee. Guided down by Whelan. It drops for Souness. Fire the post. Graham Souness levels the count. Douglas, good turn away from home that time. Souness. Some shot to beat the England goalkeeper from that range. It's with Kennedy. Now Thompson played back again for Graham Souness. And there was no stopping that. And Liverpool are back in it with a goal by Graham Souness. Joe Fagan managed Liverpool to their 15th title success before preparing for the European Cup final against Roma in their own stadium. The expectation became great and you felt the pride of the fans towards the team and the sort of hatred as such for ourselves from the rest of the country. I, I often felt like Julius Caesar in reverse, it was Bob Paisley or Joe Fagan's troops actually going to Europe and building an Adrian's war where we wanted to. In the stadium the atmosphere was intense, supporters were moved after missiles were fired at them. I remember Craig Johnson and David Hodgson saying, listen, we look a little bit nervous. What about if we sing a song going out there? So we actually sang the Chris Rea song. I don't know what it is, but I love it, going out. So as we're going past the Roma dressing room, they're listening to us singing going out, and they couldn't believe it, because we felt then 10 feet tall, confident, going out onto the pitch. And I think it showed in the first 15 minutes of the game that we played the better football and scored through Phil Neal. Unfortunately, they, they scored... Um, to equalise uh, just before half time, I think it was, which was a bit of a blow, a bitter blow. And uh, it was subsequently then down to penalties. It was just a case of Joe Fagan has to pick um, five players. So in the, in the end, he, 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 you, you'll take number five, Alan. And it was panic, panic, panic. They scored, we scored, they scored, we scored. And it came down to Bruce Grobola eventually on the Grubbler line again. and I'm telling you I'm sure no, and convinced three, three. he put Bruno Conti off the pressure was then on me but I was I was quietly confident you know I was I w yes I was confident I knew I knew I would uh, do my best I knew I would if I hit the target I would score I was looking at Mark Lawrenson right so he was watching Alan Candy over my shoulder and I thought oh go on let me see in your eyes. And I saw in his eyes, you know, it lit and then... And I ran away and I was going to do one of those, if you could pic picture Hugo Sanchez doing a backflip and whatever. And I did nothing like that. I just did a jump at the end of it, just a two foot of jump. And I thought, what a stupid thing. And I suddenly thought, well, at least it's won the cup for Liverpool. The players returned home to a tumultuous reception. Joe Fagan had won the European Cup in his first season. It was the last time Liverpool would see it for many years. The following season, Liverpool reached the final in Belgium at the Hazel Stadium. It was a disaster waiting to happen. The fence was collapsed, we just walked in. They were taking sticks off flags and piling them up. And people were just going getting them back when they were in the ground. And we were like, that's showing our ticket. And the fellow said to us, why are you showing your ticket for? You're in the ground. <laughs> All kinds of circumstances combined to create the horror. A crumbling stadium, chicken wire between two sets of fans, which is quite appalling. I mean, it, it, it's a criminal act to do that, for someone to do that. Um, and of course, what we saw was, was, was absolutely horrific. And they didn't have enough police inside the stadium to stop it in its infancy. 
So what happened is it escalated and it escalated and it escalated to the point where they were trying to get the whole of the Italian supporters out of that end. And then we heard this crack when the wall went and somebody said there's two dead, there's three dead and we realised that this was absolutely awful. Um, and we realised then that the football match was an irrelevance. Our dressing rooms were so close to where it all happened. So I went outside and had a look and I saw a wall had collapsed and I actually saw people being dragged out who were obviously dead. And I thought to myself, I can't bear this. I really honestly couldn't bear to see what was happening. I appeal for calm. A UEFA official hands me something that reads, I thought, I don't like the sound of that. I'm going to say what I feel from my heart. And I did. I threw him the papers. I'm not saying that. I can't remember what, exactly what I said on the timeline now. But I appealed for calm, went back into the dressing room. He was an impossible task, wasn't it? So he went out through the motions, and I don't even remember the game now. I don't even remember the game. 39 people lost their lives at Hazel. The investigations that followed laid the blame on inadequate policing, the poor distribution of tickets, and the behaviour of some supporters. English clubs were banned from Europe for five years. The tragedy of Hazel rocked Liverpool Football Club. Joe Fagan retired. And that's why, you know, Joe resigned. You know, he couldn't take much more, you know. Is football worth that much when, when things, tragedies like this happen? Following tradition, Liverpool appointed his successor from within the club. Not from the boot room, but from the pitch. Kenny Dalglish became Liverpool's youngest manager. Kenny took over, I think, with the help of, uh, you no know, Bob Paisley and that. He, um, no, he, so he, Kenny done a double in his first season, so there's another like one-off as well, you know. And actually combining playing with managing, uh, as, as you find out as you get older, that's not easy to do. Neil. Probing forward again, and Dalglish has made space for himself. And tries to curl it, and does! Kenny had always delivered as a player. Now he had to deliver as a manager as well. As a player manager, he relied heavily on Roy Evans and Ronnie Moran. We had the thing with him that, that, that Kenny had, had, had given us a signal if he wanted someone substituting, but sometimes we knew, well, someone wanted to substitute, and then you'd either say at half-time on the quiet team, or as the game was going on, you'd get the signal to him. But, um, he, you know, we, we'd bring him off if we wanted. He wouldn't worry about if we or you coming off, he'd come off. Kenny also brought Phil Thompson and Ron Yates back to the club. It was Kenny. I'll always be uh, beholden to him. To you know, he phoned me up and asked if I would come back, and uh, I said, "Well, give me 15 seconds to answer." And of course, I was back uh, the week after as chief scout. His team in place, Dog Leash, led Liverpool to the 1986 Championship. Fittingly, the goal that brought the title back to Liverpool was scored by the boss. Across Stanley Park, Howard Kendall had revitalised Everton. They'd won the league the year before and now stood in the way of Liverpool and the historic double. And Reed now sending Lineker into the path of Gary Lineker and double our saves, but not this time. And Everton are in the lead with Lineker. Now Wheeler, they've quickened the pace up now, Liverpool. Now Mulby, now Rush. I remember Jan Mulvey put me through for the first goal and I uh, went round St Bobby Mims in goal and um, knocked it past him. And uh, well, as soon as we went to one all, we knew we were going to win then because at the time, every time I'd scored, Liverpool had never been beaten. In for Mulvey. And it's there! It's Craig Johnston! The third one was, uh, I think Ronnie Whelan went going through and I think Kenny went to the left and I went to the right. and. Uh, Ronnie picked uh, me out instead of Kenny. Kenny still gives him stick for that now, for not passing to him. But he actually passed to me, and I managed good control and knocked it past Bobby Mims and smashed the camera at the back of the net. Oh, look at the space here now for Wheeler. Del Gleish is making a run for him. One player's gone tumbling, and it's played across the rush. That's another one, and that will make it safe for Liverpool. And a cup. And a gesture of the 
says Liverpool have done the double. Some people ask me, what's your favourite game? I say, against Everton, 1986, we've done the double. You know, it was against Everton, first FA Cup final, 1-0 down, and I, come, I scored two goals. And uh, that's, uh, that's one of the videos where now I keep looking back at. It was an astonishing achievement by Dalglish, the only player manager to win the double. Ian Rush scored 30 goals that year, but it was common knowledge it was to be his last season at the club. He was off to Juventus for a record £3.2 million. Pounds. I'd enjoy the playing side at Juventus. I enjoyed the, I enjoyed the lifestyle out there. And um, I, I think it was very defensive there. I enjoyed um, uh, going out. The owner of the club, Mr. Agnelli, and you know, I enjoyed his time being with him. And it was, um, you know, it was really incredible. It's a massive club. Liv Juventus, to me, are like Liverpool. You know, they're the two biggest clubs in Europe. Russia's replacement was an instant success, a born and bred scouser. John Aldridge was signed from Oxford and returned the investment immediately. Dalglish began to change the style of football at the club. He spent heavily on forwards Peter Beardsley and John Barnes. While he was on the probably more pressure than anyone else because he had to replace Ian Rush, which was very difficult to do. You know, he warmed to the task and and he did. You know, the goals he scored. And in many respects I think that because John Aldridge always liked crosses. Uh, I was told to get crosses in, so we got a lot of crosses in which, which, which suited John. So, you know, John just took to the task. And, and we clicked. The 87-88 season surpassed all expectations. The forward line of Barnes, Beardsley and Aldridge played some of the most scintillating football ever seen at Anfield. Liverpool completed a record run of 29 unbeaten games and won the league before the League Cup final had been played. I quickly, I believe, you know, became a Liverpool type player, whereby I didn't just, you know, dribble around players and stay on the wing, I, I moved around. Ray Houghton also came into the side uh, a few months after that and he was a Liverpool player. Um, Ronnie Whelan and Steve McMahon in midfield, Alan Hansen at the back. I mean, they were just all good footballers who could play men who understood how to play as a team and understood how to play in different positions. So therefore, they got the benefit of appreciating each other because, you know, I knew how to play up front. So therefore, I wasn't playing up front, but I could appreciate John Aldridge. And Peter Bears is an intelligent footballer anyway. I think that the, 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 if there's one word to sum up the majority, all of the Liverpool players was intelligence. In 1989, Ian Rush returned. He'd never really wanted to leave in the first place. With Rush added to the attack, Liverpool looked even more formidable. On the terraces, however, tragedy loomed. Liverpool reached the FA Cup semi-final against Nottingham Forest at Hillsborough. The game was abandoned after six minutes. Through no fault of their own, 96 people lost their lives on the Hillsborough terraces. It was the worst crowd disaster in the history of football. Merseyside and the whole of the football community were united in their grief. Football was unimportant as Dog Leash, the Liverpool players, staff and their wives tried to bring comfort to the bereaved. We can only do what, um, what we wanted to do, what we were asked to do really, because we wanted, we couldn't say anything to them because they'd lost loved ones and uh, no, we'd do anything we, we could do. You know, the club itself come second. Football came second to everything now. And we, want, we had to try and comfort them. And we wanted to try and comfort them. And, you know, they were, they were brilliant as well. Uh, people say, oh, we were as well. But them families there, they lost, after lost loved ones, um, they were absolutely brilliant with us. And they could have easily made it so hard and all that. But they, they were absolutely unbelievable. And it's something there. We should never forget that. The Hills, we should never forget it. You still. I won't go as far as to feel personally responsible, but you feel very attached to the situation because, you know, you do then say to yourself, well, if I wasn't playing or if Liverpool weren't playing, you know, those people would still be alive today. It was the, it was the saddest moment this football club has ever had, and that's quite, you know, obviously it's easy to, to say. It was devastating. The tragedy that happened at Hillsborough, you, you, you said you don't want it to ever happen anywhere else. The decision was then given to, to, the, to, to the, the fans and the family as to whether we thought we should continue. And uh, the decision they came back with was, yes, we have to play. And uh, I think it was only fitting that Liverpool should have won it, you know, for everyone concerned at Hillsborough. So it was fitting that it was a, an all Liverpool Cup final. <laughs> Once we decided to play, of course, we went out there with all the right attitude and uh, we fully expected to win.
and it was Liverpool who gained the early advantage. Okay, I was so bad, I didn't feel I was getting on with winning 1 0, and Kenny, um, I think Aldo was getting a bit tired uh, towards then, so Kenny set me on. And then when you speak to Kevin Ratcliffe after, they said, you know, John Alds, he said, we've done a great job in containing John Alds, really, you know, when I, I said, he goes off and you come on, like he said, so they, they just, their heads just went down then. But it was the Everton substitute, Stuart McCall, who equalised to bring the game to extra time. I, mean, we, I think we absolutely gutted when, uh, I think, um, they scored, you know, in last minute and all that, went into extra time and it's uh, proved Wembley to be perfect for me again. First goal, you know, to get there, managed to turn around Kevin Ratcliffe and it's in the top corner. Next thing, Everton go down and in the equalise. Oh, here we go again. You know, uh, Wimbledon before, Arsenal previously, it looked as if they, this was going to be, you know, one of those games. But of course, Ian Rush came up trumps and, and we scored the winner. Also, fans on 1 1, and we didn't really get the opportunity to go around on the lap of honor because of all the fans coming on the pitch. But we can forgive them for that, for their over exuberance because of the magnitude of the occasion. The Reds powered into the 1990s. The start of the new decade would bring them their 18th league title. It's in the back of the net. But Pemberton showing him the inside route, and it was blocked by Hopkins, rather fortunately for Crystal Palace. Nickel places it into the corner. McMahon, though, is away here. Rush inside him. McMahon chips suckling brilliantly. Barnes. Oh, and here's Beardsley. Surely a third here. Rush helps himself to it. It's Beardsley's corner. And from Barnes' flick, the scorer is Gary Gillespie. Back in the groove now with a goal in two consecutive games after a slow start and linking up with Beardsley. Peter Beardsley deserves to be amongst the scorers. Crystal Palace, for their part, haven't accepted the inevitability of their lot here. But they're in danger of losing a sixth goal. Aldridge. What an entrance it will be if he puts this away. He has done, and it's the biggest cheer of the night. Barnes sizes up the possibilities, and it goes over the wall, and it's a perfect free kick on a perfect night for Liverpool. Are in possession of another corner. Here's Hussein, and it's eight now. The one thing that they can celebrate is going to the top of the table. And maybe a ninth, yes! Nicol, who started it all way back in the seventh minute, has he rounded it off? I believe we could have gone on and done well in Europe, but that's just a throwaway line as far as I'm concerned, because we just will never be able to find out. 1990 would be Liverpool's last championship for many years. Dalglish resigned the following season. Subsequent managers couldn't emulate the success of their predecessors. As we approach the millennium, the foundations are being relayed. We know that the team is good enough and, and can be a very, very good team. And we, but we need that little bit of time and things will be right. We think we've laid down a different uh, philosophy, a different uh, attitude to, to the work and um, probably we, uh, we've got some young squad, young players, more talented. As you said, we've uh, laid down the foundations, so now it's, uh, um, I would say, let's work and let's enjoy ourselves together in the games. Liverpool have invested £10 million in their new youth academy. It's one of the best in Europe. It's already produced superstars such as Robbie Fowler and Michael Owen. 
The next generation has the desire to rekindle the success of the past. The future's bright, the structure's in place. But whatever happens, the players, staff and fans at Liverpool know they'll never walk alone.